tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. If darkness is what you're after, seek no more your searches through. You haven't found the darkness, traveler. The darkness has found you. Welcome to Season 3, Episode 4. I'm your host, Jason Hill, and I'm thrilled you could join me tonight. Tonight's story comes from author T.W. Grimm, serving up that special sauce that we've all come to savor on the Horror Hill. And this one's got some meat, so don't you go anywhere. You're listening to the standard edition of this program, if you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and all our other episodes, as well as hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today to get instant access from our friends at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Thank you for your support. Now... Allow me to escort you to a place where the sun dies, and nightmares come to life, where those who seek the darkness need look no further. Welcome, listener, to the Horror Hill. You haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. So stoke the fire and cuddle up with that warm cup of hot chocolate, because things are about to get very chilly in here. Without further ado, from author T.W. Grimm, I give you Snow Devils. One, late for a meeting. It was a bitterly cold day out there, even by mid-January standards. The jocular voice on the radio informed them that it was currently 26 below, with gusting winds, and the temperature was predicted to drop to minus 30 after sunset. There was a low visibility alert for across most of southwestern Ontario, and, for some inexplicable reason, the guy was giggling madly as he said this. Blowing snow had forced the closure of both the 401 and the 403, the DJ wrapped it up by saying that the OPP were advising folks to stay off the roads if at all possible, then went on to make some lame-ass dad joke about roasting frozen chestnuts over an open fire. <laughs> oh, fucko. We're late as shit, and now the highway's fucking closed. Well, that's pretty funny, isn't it? Fuck you. It was frigidly cold outside, but Jared Brown was sweating freely in the interior of Moe's Honda, was the goddamn heat cranked up to 11? Or was it just because he was freaking out? He squirmed against his seatbelt and unzipped his jacket. Up in the front passenger seat, Ray was laughing like a retarded spider monkey at the DJ's stupid joke. Jared suddenly realized that he hated Ray. Just a little bit. Hmm. No. That wasn't true. He hated Ray a lot. You fucking idiot! What the fuck are you laughing about? You! Of all people! Jared felt his right hand clench into a fist. His haymaker. Shut up, asshole. We're late. Do you get it? You made us late as shit. Do you understand how bad this is? We were supposed to be on the road over two hours ago. If we'd fucking left on time, we would have avoided the worst of this shit. But now? He was seeing red. Jared clenched his hands together and squeezed and he dearly wished that Ray's scrawny, tattooed little chicken neck was in his grasp. This is very, very fucking bad, Ray. Do you get it? We can't show up fucking hours and hours late. Can not. Do you? I get it. God damn. Fucking chill back there, bro. I thought it was funny, that's all. 
Ray looked back with offended, bloodshot eyes. His white ball cap was emblazoned across the front with green lettering that read, 420. Jared struggled against the urge to punch that stupid fucking sideways twisted ball cap right off the dumb bastard's skull. Oh, what was funny? Jared asked him. Was it the DJ's stupid joke? Or the fact that we're running over two hours late on a goddamn $50,000 coke deal? Huh? Clarify that shit for me. Which one was it? Beside him, Johnny Delmer calmly said, Hey, Broner, buddy, come on, chill out. You heard what happened. It wasn't completely his fault. And that made Jared even angrier. He glared at Adele's broad, bearded face and gritted his teeth. How is it not completely his fault, Dell? The rest of us, you, me, and Mo, we were all ready to go at the appointed time, weren't we? 10 a.m. sharp, and at the appointed place, the Tim Hortons on the north edge of town. None of us were sleeping off the pills in a bug-infested motel beside the airport strip joint, were we? None of us were dead asleep, with some random butterface hag of a stripper, snoring and drooling away in bed beside us. Fucking were we. No, the rest of us didn't fucking do that. He did. So, how is that not his fault? I would have made it at the Timmy's on time if my fucking car would have started, but it's too cold out. That shit froze up, dog. Ah, that whiny squeak had crept its way into the kid's voice, like it always did when someone was criticizing him for something stupid that he had done. How many times a day was Jared forced to endure that whiny, squeaky, self-righteous tone at work anyway? Dozens. He rubbed his temples and tried desperately to rein in his mounting fury. I can't smash him out, not here and now. Well, I can do that later. Oh, scratch that. I will do that later. After this is all over with, I'm gonna fucking waste that little shit. Jared took a deep breath and said, No, no, you wouldn't have made it out on time, Ray, you stupid mother... Jared gritted his teeth and started again. For fuck's sake. Look, I'll break this down for you, okay? It's real simple. You shouldn't have been out partying last night. You should have known that getting the funk to band so that you could be ready in the morning was far, far more important than shoving toonies down some Cracker Jack stripper's smelly little G-string all night. You should have known this, but you didn't. Ray opened his mouth to protest and Jared barked, No, 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 and no. Shut up. I called you, and called you, and fucking called you this morning, Ray. You wouldn't answer. Now, we're late as fuck, and it's looking like we're going to end up being even later. And it's not because your car wouldn't start, is it? Not really. It's because you went and got wrecked all to fucking back again last night, and you couldn't wake up. So, in conclusion, yeah, you fucking dummy, it is your fault. We will just call them when we get into the city, Mo said, and he changed the station with a stab of his finger. He kept his eyes fixed on the road. We are late, and that sucks, but they'll still get that cash in the end. Fucking highways are closed and shit, right? They will understand. Don't even worry about it. The new radio station flooded the interior of the Honda with pounding, grimy European techno beats, making further argument impossible. Jared sat back and tried to control his breathing. In his mind's eye, he saw the Serbs' mirrored shades reflect his own face back at him. They'd been sitting in Luca's Escalade with an envelope full of money laying on the console between them and two large, hard-faced gentlemen lurking in the back seat. Luca had said to him, This is how to go with us, now and always, okay? You will listen now to Luca, and you will listen well. When you wish to meet with us, you will call the number that I provided, and you will leave a message. You will use the code words that I have already provided to you, yes? You are listening to Luca. Ah, good. Someone will call you back within the hour, and they will tell you where and when I wish to meet with you. We will meet at this place. 
You will give me the exact amount required in an envelope such as this, and I will give you the product in question. Do you understand this thing that I've explained to you? Jared had solemnly nodded yes, and Luca favored him with a gold-plated grin. It is good then. One more thing, though, before we part. This is very important, so I ask you to listen very closely. After you have been given a time and place to meet with us, and you have agreed to these things, and then a problem should arise on your end. Luca abruptly stopped smiling. You must know that your problems are not mine. I have a business to run, and I have concerns of my own. You will come to the agreed place, and the agreed time, when you will not have problems when you get there. It will be very bad for you. Do you understand this thing as well? Jared had looked at his own reflection in those mirrored glasses and saw that he'd understood just fine. He nodded again, and Luca gave him an odd, slanted smirk, one that said, I'd actually kind of like it if you showed up with a problem, my new friend, because I enjoy taking care of problems. Go ahead and fuck with me. You'll find out. Turn that shit down for a second, Jared hollered, and Mel complied with a reluctant sigh. You know what? I think there's something that none of you are really getting here. Luca isn't an old pal that you can have a misunderstanding with and then patch things up over a couple beers while you're watching the game. He's serious shit, and he doesn't fucking know you. This is only the third time we've done business with the man, and the first two times there wasn't anywhere near as much money involved. You don't set something up on the scale with serious people that you don't really know and then fail to fucking show up with the deal, guys. That doesn't happen. He's going to think that we're fucking him around and that we got pinched, or even worse. He might think that we fucking got pinched and now we're cooperating with the cops. Do I have to tell you what that would mean for us? Well, we didn't, and we aren't, so relax. I'm trying to concentrate on the road, guy. Look at this. Mo angrily gestured with a ring-encumbered hand at the blinding sheets of snow that were whipping across the two-lane county road. In some areas, the gale had scrubbed the road bare for long distances. In others, the weathered asphalt was covered in five or six inches of loose snow. This shit is no joke. I don't need you yelling and freaking out back there. It is what it is. Let it go. Well, I'll say this, boys. At the very least, we probably just fucked up a damned good thing. Jared stared out the window at the white, barren fields beyond the glass, frigid on all sides by forested gullies and completely devoid of life. I very well might end up breathing my last breath somewhere just like this for the days through. Awesome. At the very least, the Serb is going to cut us off. That last few ounces we turned over, the cash we made, that'll be it for us. Or maybe it'll be a lot worse. Maybe we won't be making any more money at all. Ever. Mo frowned at him in the rearview mirror and turned the music up. Jared stared out the window and brooded over the lashing, winding ribbons of gale-driven snow. The road conditions were getting progressively worse. Jared was starting to question if they could even make it to Toronto at all. Why the fuck did all of these young Mediterranean guys love driving souped-up little foreign shitboxes so much anyway? Why couldn't he drive a goddamn Range Rover? Or something like that? I should have come up by myself in my truck. That's what I should have done. Well, I guess I'd still bring Dell with me. He's a brick shithouse, that guy. A lot better backup than the Arabic Bling King and fucking Vanilla Ice up there. If it weren't for the fact that the two younger men were moving most of the blow for them, Jared would have cut them out of the deal after the first transaction. They were reckless and oblivious. A heat score for sure. This went double for Ray. He was an easy bust waiting to happen. Jared had already spent some time in jail. The longest stint was three years. The Crown Attorney's reward to him for knocking off a variety store in the midst of a two-week dope and whores binge in the falls. He'd been young and completely gooned off his face on PCP. The store had been equipped with a CCTV camera, something that he hadn't thought about when he'd slammed through the door with a shotgun in his hand and an upside-down flower pot balanced jauntily on his head. Jail was a bad place, 
He didn't want to go back. Jared looked at the back of Ray's stupid ball cap and decided that, if they all somehow came out of this mess in one piece, Ray and Mo were officially out of the picture. It might make things awkward down at the warehouse, but... But what the fuck ever, man? Who cares? We'll turn this shit over and I'll triple my 12 grand easy. Maybe more. I'll quit that shitty job and then I'll finally be able to kick the living fuck out of this goofy shithead with the saggy pants and fake Gucci belt. I'll do it just to say goodbye. And Mo can either be okay with it, or he can have a taste of what Ray's gonna get too. Eh, what the fuck ever, man. I'm beyond caring at this point. The stark, barren stretch of endless fields on either side of the Honda abruptly ended, and Jared found himself looking out at a thick run of untouched woodlands that crowded the road like a skeletal lynch mob. The relentless wind drove the snow through the trees in hypnotic patterns. Watching it made Jared feel slightly calmer. He needed to be calmer, to take the rest of the journey one step at a time and not think about the near future. One step at a time, one minute to the next. That was the only way he was going to get through this. Mo turned the stereo down and looked at Jared in the rearview mirror. Guy, are you going to go for the Ford bin position that came up yesterday? You should go for it. That's what I think. You'd get it, no problem. Everyone listens to you, Guy. You're like a, a leader and shit, you know? Everyone listens when you talk. I wouldn't want that job, that's for sure, Dell rumbled. They gotta take the worst of everyone's bullshit. And the area leader takes a shit on them every other day because we're always behind on our orders. But you know what? I think it would be different for you, Browner. I really do. Just like Mo said, you're a natural leader. People respect you. Ray nodded solemnly in agreement. The hurt of Jared's tongue lashing was still visibly stamped on his narrow, peach-fuzzed face. Jared turned his eyes back to the window. Even though he hated Ray, was in fact fundamentally enraged by every aspect of Ray's feeble-minded existence, it made him feel bad when Ray looked at him like that. For some inexplicable reason, the kid looked up to him. The wrong reason, probably. Jared's own arms and neck sported a number of crudely executed jail tattoos. He was a man who was used to living under the shadow of the law, and Ray probably thought that was pretty cool. You'd be tossing salad within a week, kid, you fucking idiot. But still, he hated how it made him feel when Ray looked at him like that, like he just lost his cool and smacked a misbehaving puppy, or something. It made him feel mean and petty. Well, are you going to go for it? Mo prompted, and Jared realized that they were all waiting for an answer. He closed his eyes tight and massaged his temples again. We're right on the verge of either getting rich, shut down, or dead. And these idiots are thinking about a dull little warehouse job. Jesus wept. I don't know, he muttered finally. I don't know if I will or not. Thanks for the vote of confidence though, guys. It was all Jared could force himself to say. Everyone fell silent after that, and the only sounds were the muted roar of the heater, the rumbling crunch of the tires on the road, and the whistling of the lashing wind. The tall, stout trees swayed and bent before its power. Because of the cover that the forest provided, this section of the road was still possible to navigate without slowing to a crawl. But Jared knew that they'd soon be surrounded by gigantic open fields again, Acres and acres of flatland that would act as a runway for the blowing snow. It was only a matter of time before the shiny little Honda started getting stuck. Why now? God damn it. This crap could have held off for another 12 hours and everything would have been wine and roses. Ten minutes later, their respite came to an end. The woods petered out and the fields took over the landscape once again. The road virtually disappeared under a blanket of snow and Mo slowed the fishtailing vehicle to under 30 kilometers an hour. The wind tried its hardest to bully the Honda off the road and into the ditch. Visibility dropped to less than 15 meters. Seriously, this is bullshit, guy, Mo erupted. We're not going to make it. None of the roads are like this the rest of the way there. We're going to end up in the ditch. He hesitated, then added, I think we should turn back. Jared erupted right back at him. Are you kidding? Kidding me, man? Are you? You must be. 
Do you think that we're going to get another chance at this? Huh? Do you think Luca won't just shrug it off and let it go? He told me quite specifically that our problems are not his problems. He told me that not showing up for a deal would be very bad for us. Those are his words that I'm repeating here, not mine. Jared looked hard at each of them in turn. The Serbs were expecting to unload 50 large worth of blow on us today. And if that doesn't happen, they're going to want to ask us why. Dig it? I don't want to have that particular country- Holy shit, look out! It sprang out from the steep ditch on their left like a brown, fuzzy rocket and landed on the road less than 10 meters in front of the Honda. A doe. A big one. The doe was already tense to leap out of harm's way, but it was far too close. There wasn't nearly enough time to avoid the collision. Mo screamed, Fuck me! And he simultaneously slammed the brakes and wrenched the steering wheel hard to the right. The Civic immediately began to whip around in a fast little circle, and it spun forward to smash the deer aside with bone-crushing force. The animal's limp body was flung into the opposite ditch, and the Honda kept charging forward, spinning like a child's top as it careened from one side of the road to the other. Jared and Delmer walked their heads together. Up front, Ray was shrieking, Yo, goddamn! Over and over in a terror-induced soprano that could have shattered glass. The Civic spun across the right-hand shoulder, whipped out into empty space, then slammed down into the deep ditch with a sound like Armageddon. Ray and Delmer both briskly wrapped their heads off of their respective side windows, and the car shuddered to a halt, and the engine coughed out a great burst of murky steam from beneath the crumpled hood. Then it wheezed to a halt and died. This podcast is brought to you by the Hulu original series, Hellstrom, now streaming only on Hulu. This dark and thrilling show is produced by Marvel Television and based on characters from Marvel Comics. But Hellstrom is not your typical superhero series. This show is full of suspense, mystery, and horror, with more character-driven storylines. It's the story of two broken children, Damon and Anna Hellstrom, who are the son and daughter of a mysterious and powerful serial killer. Now adults, Hellstrom follows Damon and Anna and their complicated dynamic as they must come together to save their mother and track down the worst of humanity. Just in time for Halloween, Hellstrom is a scary, mature, action-packed series full of twists and turns you won't see coming. Every family has its demons, but not like the Hellstrom family. And the world isn't ready for a Hellstrom family reunion. Are you? All episodes of Hellstrom are now streaming. Only on Hulu. Two, Jared goes for a walk. For long moments, the only sound in the interior of the Honda was the demented howling of the wind. Jared had time to think, well, we're pretty fucked now, aren't we? And then Ray started bawling like a toddler. What the fuck? Tears streamed from his eyes. He cradled the right side of his head and rocked back and forth in his seat. What the fuck was that shit? Ow, my fucking head. Jared turned to Delmer and gasped. Del's window was smeared with blood and spiderweb with a display of deep cracks. Delmer himself was slouched forward against his seatbelt like a rag doll, unmoving. Jared grabbed his meaty shoulder and pulled him upright. Beneath his shaggy cloud of hair, Del's eyes were half-lidded and rolling senselessly around at their sockets. The right side of his face was slick with blood. His beard was dripping with it. Oh, shit. F fuck, shit. Um, Del's out cold, and he's bleeding like a stuck pig. Jared hissed. He spied a plastic grocery bag full of cloths wedged beneath the driver's seat, and he pulled a t-shirt out to use as a tourniquet for Dell's gushing skull wound. He wrapped it tightly around the unconscious man's head, and Mo sputtered. Kai, what the fuck? That's a good shirt, bro. Why'd you have to use that instead of... 
it was the first thing I saw. Who cares anyway, man? It's a shirt. You can get another one. He finished wrapping Dell's cranium and snapped his fingers in front of the burly man's slack, twitching face. Dell? Can you hear me? Delmer? Come on, buddy. That was a good shirt. Mo sulked. In my car. My fucking car! My car is ruined, guy! Uh, I'd say so, Jared replied absently. He briskly slapped Dell's hairy cheeks and yelled his name. Dell sputtered and let out a thick snore. Fuck. He's right out in space somewhere. Jesus! I think he might have broken his skull on the window. Don't you fucking die on us out here, Dell? Don't you dare! That was an Ed Hardy shirt, guy! It was kind of old, but it was still good. And my car is fucked! It was my baby! And now it is totally fucked! Seriously! Mo was babbling. He was in shock. Mo! Hey, Mo! Come on! Get a hold of yourself, man! Ray, shut the hell up! You're fine! Dell isn't. He's unconscious and his head is fucked right up! We've got some very serious problems here. Why the hell did the stupid deer jump into the road anyway? Mo pounded the steering wheel with his fist. Stupid motherfucker! Aren't they supposed to be hibernating now or something? Don't dick up, dear, don't hibernate! Jared snapped. Listen! We gotta get some help. Delmer's in bad shape. And the car is toast. I'm gonna call 911. And whatever happens after that... Happens. Luca... We'll have to wait. No idea was getting chased, dog. Didn't you guys see it? Ray looked back and forth at the other two with eyes that were wide as saucers. Yo, it was like a little tornado, you know? I've been seeing that shit the entire ride for reals, man. Little tornadoes out in the fields. You're talking about snow devils. They're not actually tornadoes, Jared muttered, and he pried Dell's eyelids open to have a look at his pupils. Ray was referring to the wintry cousin of the dust devil a small and relatively weak convection current that could lift up light debris from the ground and assume the appearance of a miniature tornado. Jared pulled out his phone and dialed the emergency number. Well, I didn't see any of that myself, but I guess a deer might be spooked by a snow devil. They are not the brightest of critters. Fuck. Nothing. I can't get the call to go through. Somebody else try. Come on, hurry up. It's gonna get cold in here fast. No, no, you don't get what I'm saying, Jared. The tornado motherfucker was chasing the deer across the fucking field. Like, it wasn't just moving around randomly and it was a coincidence that the deer wasn't in his way. It was chasing after the deer on purpose, you know? It was on that bitch! I watched it happen. The deer was running like crazy and fucking tornado thing was right on his ass! It chased the deer right onto the road and then we started spinning. And I think we hit it. Jared scowled and said, Yeah, I... Th I think you're mistaken, but how about we don't worry about that stuff right now and somebody fucking call for help? How about that? Neither Ray or Mo could get the call to go through. Jared couldn't believe it. What is this, 2002? None of us can get any reception. Bullshit. It made no sense. Was the wind somehow interfering with the signal? Was that even possible? Jared didn't know for sure, but it didn't seem likely. He'd never experienced cell phone problems from high winds before, and he'd never heard anyone else complain of such a thing either. He stared at his phone for a moment, scowling, then tucked it away in his jacket. Jared, what are we going to do, guy? Jared looked up from his reverie into Moe's scared, glassy-eyed face and almost yelled, I don't know, you dumb fuck. Why are you even asking me? Instead, he rubbed his temple some more and said, We need help. But our phones aren't working, so I guess the only choice left is to wait for someone to come driving by. And we'll try to flag them down. That's all we got right now. The old-fashioned way. Ray shook his head and snorted. We ain't passed nobody for a long, long time, bro. Ain't nobody out driving today. We all alone out here, dog. For the first time in the six long months that Jared had known Ray, the moron had finally made a concise and valid point about something. They were all alone out here. It was a Sunday afternoon, and most people in those parts didn't have anywhere in particular that they had to be on a Sunday afternoon, especially on a Sunday afternoon that is beleaguered by drifting snow and a flesh-freezing wind chill factor. The first vehicle that they were likely to see would probably be a snowplow, and on a secondary road like this one, it could be many hours before that happened. 
maybe even longer. Jared immediately pushed his thought away. He said, Well, we still need to be making ourselves visible down here, in case some farmer comes putting along in his old Chevy, you know? This ditch is at least eight feet deep. They could cruise right past and not even see us. We keep a couple of safety vests stuffed underneath my seat for work, Mo said. We can tie them to the antenna like flags or some shit, right? Jared reached down and fished the orange webbed plastic vests from beneath the seat. This is a good idea, man. For real. I'm gonna pop out and put these up on the antenna. Then I wanna go have a look at something. Keep an eye on Dell. If he starts to puke, make sure he doesn't choke on it. We better not puke, guy! Mo said sternly. Not in my car, no way! What do you want to look at, yo? Ray asked. Jared briefly considered answering him, then didn't. He pulled out his gloves and hat without a word and jumped out of the car, slamming the door shut as quickly as he could. The sides of the ditch rose steeply on either side, protecting him somewhat from the savage wind that was howling overhead. But it was still cold enough to instantly freeze the mucus inside Jared's nostrils into a painful icy glaze. The Honda was tightly wedged between the walls of the ditch, nose to tail. There was no doubt that it was a write-off. The frame and body were damaged beyond repair, and a gush of leaking engine fluids had melted a grim rainbow of green and dark brown into the snow beneath the front end. Jarrett knotted the safety vests onto the antenna as fast as his numb fingers would allow, then shoved his hands into his gloves and started trudging back to the spot where they had hit the deer. Jarrett wanted to find that doe. Despite his open dismissal of Ray's story, he felt like he needed to take a closer look at it. He trudged through shin-deep snow until he found it, the place where the doe had landed after the whirling Honda had whacked the poor beast, like a ball player hitting a homer out into the frozen ditch. There was a wide area of disturbance in the snow where the dying animal had struggled to gain its feet. The wind was rapidly sweeping the area back into a uniform smoothness. If ten more minutes had passed, Jared might have walked right past it. There was a lot of blood. The doe had been gushing the stuff like a waterfall. Jared clambered up the side of the ditch and into the field. Harsh, dirty white pellets of icy snow ripped past his face like a belt sander, making him wince and turtle down into the collar of his heavy winter coat. He took a few steps into the field and a wind gust slammed into his back, staggering him. It was hard to believe that this barren, tortured landscape would, in a few scant months, blossom into a vibrant utopia of green fields and lush woodlands. Jared scanned the crusted snow around him carefully and spotted a trail of shallow, rapidly disappearing depressions. Hoofprints. Traces of crystalline blood speckled the deer's tracks with dots of twinkling crimson. Shivering, Jared followed the deer's trail out into the massive expanse of frozen field that lay before him, a sprawling landscape of white and wind and nothing. He lurched as quickly as he could through the knee-deep snow, determined to follow the prince to their source. He'd gone this far, hadn't he? Fuck the wind and fuck the snow. Just keep moving. He narrowed his eyes against the rasping fury of the air around him and pushed on, a singular moving speck in a massive sea of dirty white. Jarrett had almost lost the trail to the wind entirely and was about to give up when he stumbled into an unusually solid little drift in the snow. Beneath the drift lay the body of the doe, stiff and bulge-eyed and dead. It was rapidly becoming just another contour of the white blanketed field, small and indistinguishable from the dozens of other drifts all around it. Jared spied the splintered end of a branch sticking out of the snow, and he used it to sweep the animal's body clear of its heavy shroud. Holy shit. This didn't happen in the accident. Oh, Jesus. The doe's hide was riddled with large, ghastly bite punctures and flayed by long, crisscrossing tears, gaping slashes so deep that they exposed frosted muscle tissue and purple bulges of intestine. The poor animal had been savaged. The collision with the Honda had probably shattered bones and hastened its demise, but the doe had already been near death when it had jumped out onto the road. What sort of predator could have done this? Not coyotes, no way. 
Not even wolves. They look like the sort of injuries that a jungle cat would inflict. A toothy carnivore with long, sharp claws. What was it that Ray had said earlier in the car? About how the snow devil had been chasing after the doe? It was on that bitch. That's what he'd said. Jared's toes were getting numb in his boots. He'd been standing out in the open for far too long. He leaned against the wind and shuffled back towards the ditch, cupping his gloves over his exposed mouth and nose to ease the rasp of the whirling snow. He was almost halfway there when he spotted the rabbit. The rabbit was about 50 meters to Jared's right and closer to the car than he was. It was small, dark brown, and running with the twitchy speed that only a terrified rabbit can muster. A whirling column of white was hot on its heels, a miniature tornado full of thick, roiling sheets of snow. Jared stopped dead in his tracks and watched the rabbit zigzag and run in circles, a brown furry blur of panic. The snow devil followed each movement precisely. It was roughly four feet across and well over twenty feet in height. It was curiously solid-looking. In Jared's experience, snow devils were generally wispy, shapeless things, far too weak to pick up enough snow to assume a definitive shape. You could usually see right through them. This one. It looked different somehow, and there was no doubt about it. The snow devil was actively pursuing the rabbit. In fact, the snow devil was gaining on it. Jared's heart started to pound hard in his chest. He whispered, Run, you motherfucker. Run! And broke into a shambling jog himself. The rabbit was on the verge of exhaustion, seeking to cram itself into a hidey hole. The panicked little beast made a desperate scramble for the ditch, and the snow devil swiftly changed course to follow. The rabbit didn't even make it halfway there. The snow devil overtook the squealing creature and snatched it up in the blink of an eye. A moment later, a spray of red and brown erupted out from the top of the devil, a glut of guts and fur that arced right into the air. The ferocious wind seized hold of the crimson gush before it had a chance to rain back down to the ground and scattered it. The devil sputtered forward a short distance further, flickering like the picture of an old, worn-out television, then collapsed into a meaningless cloud of red-tinted snow. Jared staggered to a halt again, too stunned to do anything but sway in the wind and gape like a fish at the spot where the snow devil had overtaken, then mulched the rabbit. What? What in the hell just... Move, asshole. Get moving. Now! Jared's legs lurched forward and he fought his way back to the ditch. He slid down the icy slope and his face was instantly grateful to escape the razor-sharp punishment of the wind. His nose was starting to sting and ache, as were his fingers and toes. Not good. The doe? What the hell happened to the doe? And what the fuck just happened to that fucking rabbit? But that was something to ponder back in the relative safety of the car, wasn't it? Jared hurried back to the Civic, a silvery, ovoid shape ahead that was becoming obscured by a thin blanket of white. He could see Moe's face staring out at him through the window. Jared didn't have the faintest idea what he would say about his foray into the field and what he'd seen there. He was going to sound completely crazy. I won't say anything at all if I don't have to. How's that? The blue sky overhead was heavily smudged by ripping torrents of wind-driven snow. The sun was a dim, weak little disk, hovering at the far side of the heavens, distant and frigid. The afternoon was beginning to wane towards the pitch black of a moonless winter night, and the temperature was plummeting. It seemed likely that this particular country road would remain untraveled until morning came. There was a very real possibility that they would all be spending the frigid night trapped in an unheated car, while something unknown stalked the fields around them, relentlessly searching for hot, living meat. Something concealed within a twisted column of snow. Something with claws and teeth. 3. Claws and Teeth Jesus fucking Christ, Jared shuddered. I almost fucking froze out there. 
spending any length of time out there is suicide. The interior of the Honda wasn't exactly warm, but at least it was out of the wind. The windows were frosting over from everyone's breath. Dalmer was snoring thickly beside him with his Ed Hardy adorned skull resting against the shattered window. Dale's eyelids were open slightly, showing thin crescents of white. What the hell were you doing out there, guy? Mo demanded. You were gone for a long time. We are freaking out. Yo, I was just about to bust out of this bitch and come looking for you, dog. Swear to God, Ray said. He looked cold and scared. I thought you was in trouble in some shit, yo. Nah, no trouble. Jared rubbed his face and blew into his cupped hands. I wanted to have a look at the dough we hit, that's all. Tried to track it and couldn't, so I came back. I'll tell you guys what. I'm not going out there again until I see headlights coming, and that's a fact. I don't advise that either of you two go out there. You'll lose your fucking nose to frostbite. Dell still passed out, yo. Ray's skinny, pallid face was pinched with worry. He needs help, like right now. It's freaking cold in here, man. We need to be wrapped up in blankets and shit. Jared looked to Mo, and the younger man shook his head. What? I always forget to carry shit like that in the car. We live in Canada, and it's winter. For Christ's sake, why the hell wouldn't you put some fucking blankets in your trunk? I know it is stupid. You don't gotta tell me that. Not everyone's smart like you, maybe. Mo gave him a wounded look in the rearview mirror. Jared exhaled deeply and let it go. He wasn't in much of a position to be holier than thou with anyone. He told the guys a lie, and he fervently hoped that he wouldn't be forced to tell them the truth. If they all stayed inside the Honda, down in the ditch, out of sight, he thought they might be okay then. That's what he chose to believe anyway. Ray, I'm all in favor of Dell going to the fucking hospital, believe me. But there's nothing we can do about it right now except hunker down and hope. I don't have a clue how far the nearest farmhouse is. Before we went off the road, I hadn't seen one for at least 20 minutes. On a warm spring day, sure, one of us could take a walk down the road and eventually find a door to knock on, but now? You wouldn't make it. You'd go stupid from hypothermia, wander off into the woods, and fucking freeze to death. And that would be that. They wouldn't find you until the next thaw. There's nobody living out here, guy. Not for miles. Mo looked grim. He finally understood the depth of their situation. Help has to come to us. And it will come soon enough, right? The snowplow will come through and we'll get the fuck out of here. <sighs> sure, Jared agreed. One will come around before too long and will be rescued. We just gotta hold on till then. As for Luca, I don't know what to do about that situation. Or what he is going to do about it. I guess we just won't worry about that right now. They've got more pressing concerns at the moment. Yeah, like the fact that I gotta take a piss and it's fucking freezing out there. Ray muttered. Jared stared at him for a moment, then firmly shook his head no. Oh man, you'll get frostbite on your dick. For real. I've got an empty water bottle back here. Why don't you just piss in that? We won't look. Fuck that! Mo growled. I don't want to piss in my car. That shit is out of line. He's not gonna piss in your car, Mo. He's gonna piss in the bottle. Relax. Jared gave the bottle to Ray and Mo snatched it out of his hand. No! Don't you dare to out your cock in my car, guy. Fucking seriously. Yo, what's with all the hating, dog? Ray scowled at him. I ain't gonna spill any for reals. I've done this before. And don't snatch shit out of my hands, bitch! That shit is just plain rude. Oh, 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 well, how is this? You called me a bitch in my own car again, and I will knock you the fuck out! Seriously, guy, I'll wreck you! Whatever, you fucking beaner. Hey! What the fuck, guys? Stop this stupid shit right fucking now! You're such a stupid little wigger bitch that you can't even rip on the right fucking race! I am Arab, not Mexican dumbass! Mo is short for Mohammed. Maybe you should try to learn something about the rest of the world, asshole. Okay, so you a terrorist then. Right on, bro. Good for you. That's way better. Mo's lips thinned into a hard little line and Jared put a firm hand on his shoulder. No. Come on, stop this. Everyone is stressed the fuck out. This is the stress talking, guys, not you. No, Ray sputtered, his face red. It ain't no stress talking. This camel jockey motherfucker right here running his mouth when he can't back it up. Open your mouth one more time and I will knock your teeth out, guy. 
you could go get yourself a grill then, right? That would be pretty cool. Mo, shut up. Stop it. Ray, shut up too. Mo turned his narrowed eyes onto Jared, ready to lash out, and Jared stared right back at him. Tell you what, if you guys want to scrap, go ahead. Step outside and give her. And when you're done, I'll step outside too, and I'll take on the winner. Jared nodded solemnly. And after I kick the living shit out of him, I'm going to give the loser some too, just to keep it fair. How's that sound? Mo opened his mouth, thought the better of it, and shut it again. Ray looked down at his saggy, panted lap and didn't utter a peep. Okay then. Ray, take a piss outside. I guess. If it's gonna keep the peace. Stay down here in the ditch though, man. For real. Do not go up into the field or whatever. It's cold as fuck up there. You're out of the wind down here. You're not gonna go very fucking far, dog. Don't worry. Ray cast a dark look at Mo and added, I think I'll take a piss right here. Beside this cheap little shitbox, bro. Maybe even on it. Ray jumped out into a blast of cold air and slammed his door shut behind him. Mo watched him go with naked hatred in his eyes. I can't stand that piece of shit guy. I just want to bust his fucking face in. This was all his fault in the first place. You are right. Jared nodded. Yep, I was. He's a fucking idiot. But he moves a lot of weight too, Mo. You gotta take that into consideration. We still need him. He looked away and thought, none of it's going to matter anymore pretty soon. Either the cold is going to kill us, Luca is going to kill us, or whatever's cruising around the field is going to fucking kill us. Beside him, Dell abruptly let out a thick, phlegmy snort and mumbled, This is in the whirlwind. I just like wind is close and teeth. Jared gaped at him and the fine hairs in the back of his neck stood up like stiff little quills. What the fuck? Dell's head was still craned to rest against his shattered window. His eyes were fully open, but only the bloodshot whites were showing. Dell was drooling heavily into his beard, staring out the window with those sightless eyes at nothing at all. Nothing that Jared could see, anyway. What did you say, Dell? Mo was twisted in his seat with his back against the dashboard, cowering as far away from Johnny Delmer as he could. Jared, what's he talking about, guy? Is he actually awake? I'm talking about death, Del burbled. Spit bubbles inflated and popped as he spoke. I'm talking about predators and prey. <laughs> Guess which one you are. Del got fucking scared in me, guy. Stop it. Mel pleaded. He looked at Jared and stabbed a finger in Dell's direction. Seriously, he's freaking me out. What is he talking about? Um, Dell? Jared said carefully. Is, is it? Is it you who we're talking to now? Dell's response was to grin widely and fart. His breathing was shallow. It rattled in his chest like a venomous snake. Who am I talking to? Jared whispered. Who are you? I'm screaming in the dark. Del gurgled. His eyelids fluttered. There are faces in the whirlwind, Jared. Claws and teeth in the snow. Ask Ray. He'll know all about it. Soon enough. He's climbing up the slope right now. Do you see him? Jared twisted in his seat just in time to see Ray's scrambling feet disappear up the side of the ditch. Oh, fuck, Ray! Jared, what the fuck is this? Mo's eyes were wide and wet. We're all going to die tonight, Dale whispered. We're all going to die, and then we'll scream. We'll scream with the others in the wind. Shut up! Mo shrieked. He looked back to Jared and pleaded. Make him shut the fuck up. He's freaking me out, and I don't want to be here anymore. I have to get Ray back in here, man, okay? 
just ignore anything he says and fucking get a hold of yourself, all right? Just hang tight for a minute. Don't leave me here with this creepy fucker, please, guy! Mo reached out to snare a panicked fistful of Jared's coat. Jared snarled and slapped the hand aside with a blurred snap of his wrist. He seized the younger man by the base of his skull and squeezed. Mo whimpered and clutched weakly at Jared's wrist. Jared squeezed harder. Fuck off and get a grip on yourself right fucking now. Don't be a punk. Quit panicking and keep your shit together. Got it. He tightened his hard, calloused grip on Moe's skull once more, for emphasis, then released him. Stay here and calm the fuck down. I'll be right back. There wasn't time to be any nicer about it, as much as Jared didn't like Ray. Well, there was the rabbit. Ray was a fuck-up and Ray needed an ass-kicking for sure, but but he didn't deserve what was waiting for him in the field. That was too much. Jared jumped out of the car and bounded up the steep slope of the ditch in four great scrambling leaps. At the top, the wind was waiting for him, breathtakingly cold and savage as a headhunter. Jared's exposed skin immediately began to tingle and smart against the abrasive atmosphere around him. His sinuses ached. Ray's oversized camo print jacket was a small green and brown smudge in the distance. He was wandering out into the middle of the field, shambling through the deep snow like a man in the grip of a dream. Jared plowed along after him. His breathing quickly became labored and harsh. It had been two years since he'd last smoked a cigarette, but it seemed that the long-term damage had already been done. Jesus. I really hope I won't have to run for it because I'm fucking wiped. I'm not a young buck anymore, no, sir. Ray suddenly stopped dead and stood there in the knee-high snow, his arms dangling at his sides and his body rocking back and forth like a sapling in the roaring gale. Jared plodded up with burning lungs and shook him by his shoulders. Ray, what the fuck are you doing, man? Why the hell'd you come out here? Ray turned to face him and his eyes were dark and huge, the eyes of someone who had been heavily drugged. He slurred. I was taking a piss and then I thought it would be nice to come out here and say like, Hi, no? Someone told me I should come, come say hi. Ray trailed off. The slack hypnotized expression abruptly disappeared and was replaced by a look of confusion. I... I... I don't, don't know why, why I came out here, dog. It's fucking cold and shit out here. Ray looked around them wildly. I... I can't even remember coming out here. I, I can't... I, I don't... I, I don't even... Aw, oh, man, fuck this. Ray brushed past him and started trudging back to the car. Jared followed close behind. The ditch seemed very, very far away. Something grabbed the dumb bastard by a slow-witted brain and walked him out here, just like a puppet. They needed to get back to the car, and fast. Ray, I, I think we'd better hurry up, bud. Let's pick up the... P oh, shit. Look, it's one of those fucking tornado things! Jared wheeled around and saw that a towering dervish was bearing in on them from across the field, moving like a speeding freight train along the shifting landscape beneath it. The devil was as tall as a telephone pole and well over eight feet across, a mammoth disturbance of snow and wind, and something else, something malevolent. Ray, Ray, go! Run your ass off! Go! Jared shoved Ray ahead of him and they all out ran for the ditch. Jared's lungs immediately began to burn. His legs went rubbery. His boots felt like they were made of lead. He shouted, Don't stop and don't look back! And then, there was only the screaming wind, the crunch of boots on snow, and harsh panting of white frosted breath. The ground was frigid quicksand that sucked at the fleeing men's feet and the gale constantly pushed them back with a thousand icy hands. It seized hold of Ray's hat and sent it spiraling up into the sky. 
Jared's throat convulsed on a strangled scream. They weren't going to make it. There was simply no way they were going to make it to the ditch. It's right fucking behind us! He could actually hear the thing. Its roar mimicked the high-pitched shriek of the blasting wind, but it was really the triumphant howl of a carnivore, a ravenous beast that is moments away from leaping upon its kill. Jared tried to put on a burst of speed, but he had nothing left. Beside him, Ray looked over his shoulder at the thing that loomed behind them, and his face clenched into a rictus of horror. Jared kept running. He heard Ray scream, Jared! Come help me! And then there was an indescribable tearing sound. Unbidden, Jared's brain spat up the image of a wet blanket falling into the whirring blades of a gigantic fan. Jared pumped his leaden feet and kept his gaze fixed on the approaching ditch. He did not look back. Tears froze on his cheeks. He didn't dare look back. Not like Ray did. He didn't want to see what... Faces in the whirlwind. Eyes like windows. Claws and teeth. Ray had seen. No. No and no again. Jared staggered the last few ungainly steps to the ditch and hurled himself face first down the slope. He tumbled like a hoop to the bottom and landed on his back, wheezing and trembling. He tried to get up but couldn't. His limbs were dead and his lungs were on fire. There was no more to give. He was done. Heart frozen in his chest, Jared curled into a tight little ball and he waited for the devil to fall into the ditch and tear him apart. A minute went by, then two, and then five more. Grimacing against the stiffening in his legs, Jared heaved himself to his feet and cautiously crawled up the slope until he could see out into the field. The snow devil was gone, but it had left something behind. A giant splotch of red-streaked snow. He's with them now. He's in the wind. Jared slid back down to the bottom of the ditch and, numb right down to his soul, he limped back to the car. Out in the field, the wind rapidly covered Ray's sparse remains in a thick, shifting shroud of white. Within minutes, every trace of him was buried and gone. 4. Catch You, Eat You Where's Shay? Jared didn't answer him. Not right away. He was staring at Johnny Delmer. Dell's head was once again resting against the window. He looked like he was taking a nap on a long car ride to hell. His eyelids were closed now, and his face was slack and still. Dell's beard was cemented with a slushy mixture of freezing blood and drool. He looks like a prop from the set of a horror movie, Jared said. Jesus. Did he say anything else while I was gone? Yeah, he did. And it bummed me out, guy. As soon as you left, he turns to me and says, You'll be next, little rabbit. And then he just kind of slumped over and stopped talking. Next for what? Why'd he call me a fucking rabbit? Jared shrugged. Don't worry about it right now, man. We've got... What happened to Ray? Why isn't he with you? Mo's eyes were wide, frightened, and glistening. Something bad happened. I can see it in your face. Tell me what happened. That's what I'm trying to do, for fuck's sake. Be quiet for a second. Jared kept staring at Delmer's inert bulk. His face was deathly pale, save for twin blotches of high, hectic red on his stubbled cheeks. Mo, listen to me. There's something out there, man. Out in the fields. Remember what Ray said earlier? About how he saw a snow devil chase that deer out onto the road? So, dear, you did find it, didn't you? Mo's voice was very small. You lied about it. Yeah. I did. I thought it was for the best at the time. 
I found the dough and it was mangled all to shit and back again, like something completely savaged that fucker. Mo crossed his arms to suppress a shiver. That didn't happen when he hit it. Jared shook his head. His eyes didn't waver from Dell's face. Not for a moment. Nope. Not a chance. The doe spooked me pretty bad, but then I saw one of those things go after a rabbit. It caught him. What was left of it got blown away by the wind. Mo's mouth turned down into a small, frightened little crescent. Get the fuck out, he whispered. I didn't tell you guys because I wanted to wait until I had to. The situation was shitty enough already without that particular fact being out in the air. Mo nodded slowly, his eyes large and dark. Sometimes, not knowing is better. I get that. Did, uh, when Ray went out there into the field, did, did he? Jared swallowed hard and said, When I went back out into the field to find him, Ray was just standing there, swaying in the wind. He looked like a sleepwalker. He said that a voice in his head told him he should come out and say hi. He didn't even remember going out there. We were on our way back and one of those things, the snow devil, it came out of nowhere and chased us. We ran like hell but it was too fast. It was right on top of us and Ray looked back at it even though I told him not to. He looked back and what he saw made him trip over his own feet. I... I didn't stop to help him. I kept running. Mo scrubbed his hands over his face and let out a quavering little sigh. He's dead. Jared was studying Johnny Delmer again, his expression sharp and watchful. He nodded. Yeah, yeah, he's dead. He's... There was nothing left of him but a lot of blood in the snow and a few scraps of his jacket in the wind. Faces in the whirlwind, Mo breathed. That is what Del said, isn't it? Something about eyes, too. And teeth. His lips were trembling. I can't handle this shit, Jared. This is too fucking scary for me. I've got a, I've got a nervous condition. I, 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 can't, I can't handle scary shit like this. You have to try and stay calm, man. Panicking and freaking out isn't going to help us. Clear thinking might. And I'll tell you what I think. I think that these things are trapped in the fields. <clears throat> it seems like they can't cross the ditch. Jared coughed and winced. His throat was raw from inhaling the icy blasts of gritty snow that shrieked and gibbered endlessly just outside their frail fiberglass shelter. That dough was ripped up pretty bad. But I've seen what these things can do, and there shouldn't have been anything left to jump out onto the road in the first place. I think it just barely grazed the doe as she was jumping to clear the ditch, just for a split second, just long enough to slice her up. If it was able to cross the ditch and follow her, it would have. I'm sure of it. What makes you so sure, guy? No, it was starting to slide towards panic again. What? Did you stop to ask it or something? Was that before or after it chewed up Ray and spat him out? Huh? How the fuck do you know for sure? Because if they could, they would have gotten us by now. But they haven't. How am I supposed to keep calm if you're going to keep saying shit like that? Mo hissed. He flapped a hand at Dell. And then there's this fucking guy here saying weird stuff like, You'll be next and little rabbit and fucked up shit like that. Seriously, what the hell is that supposed to mean? I'm, I'm next for what? Next to die? Fuck you, Delmer. Well, Jared said slowly, if that's what he meant, he was wrong. You aren't the next in line. Del was. I've been watching him for a few minutes now and he hasn't moved or drawn breath even once. He's starting to turn blue. Jared hesitated, then added, I'm pretty sure he's dead. Oh, fuck me. 
Mo closed his eyes tightly. I mean, sitting in here with a dead body? Uh, not for much longer. We're gonna jump out real quick and pull him out of here before he gets frozen into a sitting position. I'm not touching him. No way. No, that's too much. Mo shook his head violently. Not gonna do it. Yeah, you will. This fucker's got away at least 240, probably more. I'll have a hell of a time trying to do it myself. It'll be quicker and easier with the two of us. I don't want to touch a dead body. Seriously, guy, no. That's fucking gross. Seriously, guy? Yes, you will. Jared's cold terror was beginning to heat and boil up into anger. He could see that Mo was showing his true colors, as people always do when the chips are down. For all of his bluster and pomp, Mo was, in all actuality, something of a crybaby bitch. Jared's patience was at an all-time low, and he'd never been known for his patience. I don't want to have to say this again, bud. You're going to get the fuck out of the car, just like a big boy would, and you're going to help me drag this dead, burly son of a bitch the fuck out of here. Now, before you speak, remember, I'm not going to be happy if I have to repeat what I just said. Mo was crying. He was trying his best not to, but he was. Okay, okay, just don't get mad at me, guy. Don't, please. I'm shitting bricks over here. This is too fucking scary for me. I, I have a nervous condition and I, I can't deal. He's telling you the truth, you know. He's very, very afraid. We can smell it. And the wind. Dell rasped and Jared flinched back against the door hard enough to wrap his head. Dell started to grin. His eyelids flew open, and his eyes looked like frosted over marbles. He sat upright and turned his head to the left, pinning Jared to the door with a gaze that was horribly flat, horribly dead. Every movement Johnny Delmer made was accompanied by a brittle crackling sound. The sound of frozen tissue being made to flex and bend. Mo screamed and slid off his seat. He cowered beneath the steering wheel with his face in his hands. We could smell that you little rabbits were down here, hiding in your hidey hole. We could smell your fear, your sweat, and your blood. Del grinned even wider. Blood, sweat, and fear. So sweet. It pained us that you were out of our reach. It was intolerable. Del's words generated no vapor. His breath was as cold as the winter air itself. Kick it! Kick it in the face! Mo shrieked, and the piercing note of hysteria broke Jared's paralysis. He rocked back and drove the heel of his boot at the dead thing's nose. Del caught it easily. His grip was impossibly strong. Jared lashed out wildly with his other foot and Del snatched it out of the air without even flinching. He clamped both of Jared's legs under his arm and reached for the door handle with his free hand. Jared wailed and sat up to batter Del's face with desperate fists. Del's nose broke teeth shattered. Del grinned jaggedly and popped the door open. Now, there is a way, Del crooned. His voice was the chattering of dead leaves on winter branches. Now, we have a vessel. The horror that wore Del's body like a costume let out a dry, rusty cackle and started dragging Jared out of the car. He screamed and seized hold of the driver's seat with hands like claws. The Dell thing gave his legs a tremendous yank, and his body was jerked halfway out of the car. Frigid air slid up the back of Jared's rucked-up coat and mauled his skin. He scrabbled for purchase like a cat with clumsy gloved hands and screamed, Mo, God damn it, help me! Get out here and tackle that fucker! Slow him down! Do something! Del's corpse gave his legs another tremendous yank, and Jared's face hit the ground. He fought to roll over and couldn't. 
Jared flailed and screamed, choking on mouthfuls of dirty snow and road salt. He felt himself being pulled up the slope of the ditch and flailed his arms like a madman. No, 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 no! There was a sudden commotion above him. Dell's unbreakable grip on his legs relaxed for a moment, and Jared spastically kicked his way free. He somersaulted down the slope and landed on his ass. A split second later, Dell and Mo came tumbling down after him. Their rolling bodies crashed into Jared's back, and there was a brief confusion of kicking legs and pumping fists. Mo tried to clock the Dell thing in the jaw and whapped Jared on the nose instead. Jared flopped flat onto his back with his nose spurting and stars exploding behind his eyes. He windmill kicked his legs blindly in the direction of the melee until he could see again. Jared sat up and, through the prism of involuntary tears in his eyes, he saw that Dell had Mo pinned down and had his dead blue hands clamped around Mo's throat. Mo's heels were stomping deep indents into the snow, a frantic drumbeat of oxygen deprivation. Jared scrambled to his feet and pulled a double-edged hunting knife from his coat, his discreet insurance against unexpected trouble during their meeting with Luca. A wordless howl on his lips, Jared flung himself on Delmer's back and stuck the eight-inch blade into his neck, all the way to the hilt. Del twisted around to grab him and Jared wrenched the knife in the opposite direction. Razor-sharp steel sliced through freezing flesh like it was butter, and Del's neck opened up like an obscene flower in bloom. Jared roared up to the sky and yanked the blade the other direction. The sharp edge pushed between two vertebrae, and, like magic, Del's hairy cranium was suddenly hanging against his chest by a few strings of meat and skin. The Delmer thing jabbed backward with an icy elbow and knocked Jared sprawling. Agony flared in his side, and he writhed like a squashed spider in the snow. Del tottered to his feet and, Mo temporarily forgotten, he advanced on Jared with blindly grasping hands, severed head swaying in front of his chest like the ghastly pendulum in Satan's grandfather clock. Mo sat up and was wrenched by a coughing fit. He was covered in snow and his face was a dull shade of brick red. Mo, he's still coming. Help me get him down. Jared forced himself to stand and met the staggering horror's advance with a savage kick to the outside of its knee. Dell's legs snapped into a crooked line, and he toppled slowly, as if his windmilling arms were somehow keeping him buoyant in the air. The momentum of his falling bulk swung his dangling head around in a vicious arc, it ripped free from its gristled moorings and went flying in the opposite direction. One of the windmilling hands snagged Jared's coat and he was dragged down to the ground. They landed in a heap and Jared's broken rib thrust a long spear of pain into his side, hot and savage. He yelled, Let go of me, cocksucker! and stuck his blade repeatedly into the headless thing's chest and abdomen. It was like stabbing a frozen side of beef. Mo, what the fuck are you waiting for, man? Help me! Mo had a look of pure, dumbfounded terror on his face. He attempted to get up off his ass, failed, then proceeded to throw a series of loosely packed snowballs at the combatants, keening and sopping like a child as he did so. Jared panted, For fuck's sake, man, get over here and help me! and then hands like blocks of frosted iron clamped onto either side of his head and squeezed. Jared wailed. The pressure was immediate and unbearable. He pulled the blade out of Dell's chest and stabbed impotently at the monstrosity's arms. He could hear the low, groaning screech of his own skull creaking between the thing's massive palms like the beams of an old house. Suddenly, Mo came streaking in from above, and landed on them both with his knees, much like a professional wrestler diving onto his opponent from the top of the turnbuckle. The trio was briefly embroiled in another cartoonish confusion of flailing limbs and clouds of snow, which ended with Mo sitting on Delmer's back and Jared laying across his legs. Del's reanimated corpse was incredibly powerful. Mo and Jared succeeded in pinning it down for a whole two seconds before it heaved and flung them through the air like toys. 
It managed to lurch to its feet, but its broken leg gave away entirely at the first step, so it began to crawl instead. Jared and Mo circled away and watched as their former friend and co-worker wormed through the snow with blindly searching hands, seeking out a living body to present as an offering for the puppet masters above, the devils that dwelled in the wind and snow. He's still moving around, Mo said. His voice was a squeak. Guy, seriously, he doesn't even have a fucking head and he's still moving. He's still fucking moving around, guy. What the fucking shit? Mo, stop looking at it, Jared commanded, and look at me instead. No, don't look at it, just look over at me and listen. Jared studied Mo frankly for a long moment, his expression appraising and blunt. He paused to wipe a freezing slush of blood from the lower half of his face with his sleeve and said, We can't stay down here in the car anymore. That thing will just rip off the doors and drag us out. We have to leave. We have to cross the road and get into that gully on the other side of the field. I think that the devils are fenced in by the ditches and woods that border their territory. I don't think that they can leave the fields. If we run across that field and make it to the gully, we can cross it and get over to the next major road. It's right on the other side of that gully. I know it is. We'll never make it, Mo said. He was shivering. They're too fast. They'll catch us. Even if they don't, Guy, we'll freeze to death. I'm already freezing. Jared pointed at the obscene thing that was hunting for them on its belly, like a bloated carnivorous worm, and he snarled. This bastard here is the motherfucking Energizer Bunny. It'll never give up. Not until we're both dead. If you want to stay here, you're going to have to cut it into pieces. Get it? Take its arms and legs off. Jared shook his head and circled away. Nell was crawling too close for comfort. If you want to try, I'll lend you my knife and my best wishes because I'm not going anywhere near that piece of shit. <coughs> Motherfucker broke my rib and he almost crushed my skull. The crawling thing sensed Jared's presence and it wriggled towards him with eerie speed. He jumped away and said, See that? This fucker doesn't quit. Making a run for the county road is probably our only chance, and I am taking it. I'm not going out there. Are you crazy? Mo squealed, and he backpedaled from Delmer's clutches. We can walk down the road, guy. You said they can't cross the ditch onto the road, right? We'll just take the road back the way we came. And die of exposure, Jared finished. We've already been through this. There's nothing for miles back there. Just woods and fields and certain fucking death. Listen, man, you've only got two choices here. You can come with me and maybe live. Or, Jared pointed at Dell. or you can stay here with him. Mo's face was miserable and afraid. I'm scared, he whispered. The wind stole his words. I'll take that as a yes. Jared turned to the car and muttered, Wait a sec. I gotta grab something first. He nodded towards Dell. Watch out for that cocksucker. Jared dug around the back seat and pocketed what he was looking for. He turned back to find that Mo was now standing halfway up the slope of the ditch. The monstrosity was snatching at the trampled snow where Mo had just been standing. Jared put up his hood and clambered up the slope to join him. Mo looked like he was ready to fall into pieces. We aren't going to make it. His words were much like his voice, small and weak. Jared barked. Stop saying shit like that, would ya? And winced. Beneath the hum of his pumping adrenaline, his broken rib was screaming. His nose ached and throbbed. It was full of frozen blood. Of course we'll make it. Once we cross the other ditch, just put your head down and run, man. Don't stop. What are these things, guy? Mo clutched at Jared's sleeve and looked at him with pleading eyes. Why are they after us? Because we're warm and alive, and they're cold and dead, Jared thought, and said, How should I know? I don't fucking know any more than you do. All I have is a guess, same as you, and we don't have time to be playing guessing games. I'm cold, the light's fading, 
and that gruesome motherfucker is gonna crawl up here to grab us in a minute or two. So get fucking moving, now! Jared gave him a shove and Mo got moving. Jared started after him, then spied something that stopped him dead in his tracks. It was Del's hand. It was planted deeply into the snow just a few feet away. Del's head was slowly being covered by the shifting snow. His eyes were icy white spheres, and his lips were purple. They were moving. He was saying something. Jared wasn't a lip reader, but he was pretty sure that Johnny Delmer's decapitated head was mouthing the words, Catch you. Eat you. Over and over again. He scooped up a big double glove full of snow and hurled it into the thing's face. The movement of its lips dislodged the snow, and the hateful litany continued. Catch you. Eat you. Catch you. Eat you. Fuck you! Jared growled. Eat shit! How's that? He hocked a greenish wad of phlegm into its face, then turned his back and clambered up the slope. Overhead, the pale slip of a sun was sliding quickly towards the tree line, where it would be extinguished in cold and shadow. Nightfall was coming. Five. Winter is hungry. Standing on the road was almost like standing on the surface of a frozen, hostile alien planet. The road was buried in ten inches of snow as far as the eye could see, which wasn't very far. The shrieking air carried a million icy, whirling little daggers. They immediately strafed Jarrett's face into numbness and made his lashes freeze together from the watering of his eyes. Mo was standing with his back against the onslaught, arms wrapped around him and knees bent to brace against the bullying wind. He shouted, Guy, this is unreal! We're going to fucking freeze to death out here! We'll be okay when we get to the gully! Jared hollered back. We'll be out of this bastard of a wind! We can build a fire! He studied the field that lay on the other side of the ditch. At this point, it was impossible to see how far the tree line was from the road. It was too distant, lost in the blowing snow. Four hundred meters? Five? How far could he run with a broken rib anyway? I hope that I don't have to do it, Mo. It was best not to think about that, not unless he had to. Jared gripped Mo's shoulder and said, We can do this, bud. We can make it. When we get into the field, put your head down and run. And keep fucking running. Don't look around. Just fucking run. Okay? You ready? Mo shook his head no, miserably. Jared started for the opposite ditch and pulled Mo along behind him. They skidded on their heels to the bottom. This ditch was much shallower than the other. Jared could easily look out into the field while standing at the bottom. It was a bleak, dim hellscape of massive winds and desolate spaces. A man could wander out into that howling void and never be seen again, Jared thought. How many abandoned vehicles have they found in the ditches out here over the years? How many deer hunters and hitchhikers have gone missing? never to be seen again. Winter is hungry. Jared understood that now. Winter will devour you, whole and screaming, and leave no trace of you behind. Jared! Mo pointed behind them. Jared turned to see that Delmer was laboriously heaving himself across the road on his hands and one knee, dragging his broken leg behind him. His neck hole gaped at them like an eye. Jared croaked, Come on, let's go! And he scrabbled up the short icy slope into the full wrath of the wind. It ripped the breath from his lungs and raked his face raw. Overhead, the sky was fading to violet with the setting of the sun. Night was almost upon them. Jared could hear Moe struggling close behind, already gasping from a sedentary life of drinking beer and riding around all day on a forklift. Jared's rib was screaming with every jarring step he took. He gritted his teeth and kept his eyes focused in the general direction of the tree line that lay somewhere ahead. They were lost in the shrieking void of winter's fury. It would be dangerously easy to run in a large circle and end up back at the road. 
Don't run in a circle, you dumb shit. Don't you fucking dare. Keep steering a bit to the right. Mo was starting to make pathetic, mewling noises of exhaustion. He was slowing them down. You fat fuck, I am older than you and I've got a broken rib. Jared suddenly hated him intensely, passionately. He probably always had. The hatred made him feel better about this decision. I can't see anything, Mo screamed at him. We'll die out here whether they get us or not. My face is freezing. Shut up and keep going, you fucking idiot, Jared roared. Save your breath. Jared wasn't about to let Mo turn back. Hell no. He was needed. Mo was an integral part of the new plan. The envelope that Jared had taken from the car before they left was slapping a painful beat against his injured side, taut and feverish. It contained $50,000. Their combined investment on today's aborted deal. They'd all been co-workers and business partners, yes, but two of those partners were no longer in the picture. What was left of Ray had been scattered by the wind. And as for Johnny Delmer, well, he wasn't going to be showing up for work on Monday either, was he? Dell had been reborn, and in his new life he had a horrible new calling. He was now a caretaker of the fields, a servant of the things that dwell in the shrieking winter winds. Dell was lost. Maybe they won't come for us, Jared thought wildly. Maybe they've had enough. Maybe they've had their fill and they'll just leave us alone. Jared! Mo shrieked, and the raw terror in his voice made Jared stumble. Mo ran into him and clutched his arm in a death grip. It's coming. Run, guy. Run like fuck! The devil was a monolithic vortex. The biggest yet. A twisting worm that housed unspeakable horrors. Jared's guts turned to water. There would be no choice then. But $25,000 wasn't enough to start a new life anyway, was it? Not really. Fifty. Fifty was the magic number. Jared's hand darted into his pocket. He pulled out his knife. I'm sorry, Mo, he whispered, and he slammed the blade deep into Mo's stomach. Mo went rigid and gurgled. And his yellow parka immediately bloomed with a spreading stain of crimson. Jared grunted and jerked the knife upwards, splitting open cloth and flesh. A leaking hunk of Moe's intestinal tract spilled into the snow between them. Moe weakly grasped the knife, and Jared shoved him away. He took two great, staggering steps backward and fell onto his ass. A look of pain disbelief stamped on his face. Then, the agony hit him through the shock, and Mo wailed, clutching his abdomen and struggling to gain his feet. His guts were sliding into his lap. He tried to push them back in, then vomited explosively. Jared turned heel and fled. Mo wailed after him. Why? Why would you do that to me, you bastard? You motherfucker! It's coming, Jared! It's coming! Don't leave me here! Please! Don't leave me here! Don't look back, Jared panted to himself. Don't you fucking look back! Mo's screams became more frantic. He sounded uncannily like the rabbit, moments before it had been torn to pieces. Don't look. You don't want to see this. Jared looked back. He didn't want to, but he did. He couldn't help it. The devil was looming high above poor, hapless Mo, who was screaming his last scream and holding his arms out in a futile attempt to ward off his impending doom. He was insignificant before it, a mouse standing in the path of a dragon, a flickering campfire in the face of a tsunami. The whirling mass was roaring, bellowing with an untold number of voices and vocalizations, all of them growling and howling and shrieking as one with cold, insane glee. In the fading light, 
Jared saw that there were faces in the whirling snow. He saw a blurred, confused montage of hateful faces of all description. Human, bovine, wolven, insectoid. Faces of all kinds. Faces in the whirlwind. There were flashing claws and there were teeth bared for the kill. But the eyes, the eyes were the worst. The faces had blank eyes like windows, and what Jared saw on the other side of those windows made him scream like a woman. For a brief instant in time, Jared, Mo, the devil, and the wind all sang a nightmare harmony of death together that spiraled up and up into the dark slate of the winter sky above them. And then, the snow devil enveloped its prey. Mo was sucked in and instantly shredded in a terrific splatter of blood and fragments of flesh. The spinning column changed in color from a dirty white to a dark, rich red. It sluggishly bore forward for a few more feet, then collapsed. Bloody snow fell heavily to the ground, and the wind snatched at it with a scavenger's furtive greed. Within seconds, not a single trace of Mo remained. Jared turned away and staggered onward, pushing himself to move fast. He had no more sacrifices to offer in his stead. After a minute or two, the wind dropped long enough for the tree line to come into view, and he ran for it, with one hand clutched to his ribs and tears streaming in freezing tracks down the rough plains of his cheeks. He stumbled through the skeletal border of dead grasses and shrubs and fell against the trunk of a birch tree, wheezing and trembling. Complete darkness abruptly fell like a curtain, and he crawled away into its depths further into the woods and away from the field. When he reached the deeper blackness that signified the edge of the yawning gully, Jared stopped crawling and curled into an exhaustive ball in the snow. It was cold in the woods, cold enough to freeze his breath, but he was finally out of the wind. He couldn't feel his nose, cheeks, or his fingertips. Frostbite for sure. But he was alive. Rest for a while. Catch my breath. Then I'll make my way through the gully and hope like hell I can wave down a collar on the other side. Get to town, get checked out at the hospital, then blow the fuck out of here in the morning. Go to Mexico, maybe. Somewhere warm. Somewhere it doesn't snow. Not ever. The roaring wind overhead made the tall, straight trees around him creak and rustle. They plucked a screeching, discordant melody on the frayed strings of Jared's nerves. His heart continued to thunder away in his chest and he was sweating in the frigid air. Something wasn't right. Did he hear something approaching? What was that? Jared clambered to his feet, straining to hear above the wind in the trees. There was a crackling of dead branches somewhere close by. A muted thump. A hand clamped down on his ankle in the dark. Shit, fuck, God damn it! he screeched. Then he kicked free of the grasping thing with a spastic jerk of his leg. Another hand clutched at his pant leg and Jared jumped back, thudding against the tree with a winded grunt. It was Dell. His headless corpse had somehow managed to follow Jared all this way, slowly and implacably, crawling through the snow like a remote-controlled toy, feeling searching. Jared ran blindly down into the gully. He ran headlong into trees and thorn bushes, flailing and scrabbling in a mindless panic. He ran and gibbered and sobbed and fell and rolled his way down the slope. Jared started to laugh after a while. It was the cracked, hysterical cackling of a madman, dragging itself on its belly. The dead thing followed. Epilogue. Time to feed. Constable Rick Edgemont responded to his second call of the day at shortly after 6 a.m. 
He was able to arrive at the scene fairly quickly because the first call of the day had taken him right nearby. Just over on the next concession, someone had reported an abandoned vehicle in the ditch. There had been no sign of occupants. The two calls were probably related. The second was from a snowplow operator who'd found someone wandering around on the road, disoriented and suffering from exposure. Constable Edgemont noted that the EMT guys were not on the scene yet, and grimaced. He'd received some basic first aid training, but that was where his medical knowledge ended. He hoped that the guy wasn't too badly messed up. Frostbite could be a nasty business. He pulled up behind the snowplow and noted that the plow driver was standing out in the cold, leaning against the back of the plow and smoking a cigarette with a trembling hand. Edgemont got out of his patrol car and called out, Good morning, I'm Constable Edgemont. I'm guessing you're the one who called us. He crunched closer through the plow-packed snow and added, Gotta say, you look like a man who's wishing that he didn't get out of bed this morning. What's the story? Found a guy wandering in the ditch down there, about half an hour ago. The plow driver's skin was deathly pallid against the dark carpet of stubble on his face. Says his name's Jeremy or something like that. He's in the cab right now, warming up. He's hurt pretty bad. Cut and scraped all to hell. And he says he's got a broken rib. Nose like a squashed tomato on him too. On top of that, fella's got a real bad case of frostbite all over the goddamn place. Wouldn't be surprised if he loses his nose and ears. Hell, his old goddamned face. Hands and feet too, I'd bet. Edgemont whistled between his teeth and shook his head. I wish to hell people would heed the weather warnings and stay inside. He motioned up at the calm, clear sky. Now, today's looking like it's going to be livable. Yesterday was a mean one. The guy sitting in your cab probably lost control of his vehicle in a snow squall. I was just checking out a vehicle in the ditch when I got this call, in fact. I bet he went looking for help and ended up freezing all night out there in the bush. Sound about right? The plow driver gave him a strange look and spat out onto the road. Yeah, something like that. Got lost in the dark, I guess. He said that he thought he was going to die out there. He said a lot of things once he warmed up enough to stop his teeth from shattering. A lot of... very peculiar things. The plow driver made a circular cuckoo motion beside his temple. I think the boy's more than a little bit off his rocker, if you know what I mean. He, uh... Well, I guess you'll see for yourself in a minute. That's why I was waiting for you out here. Not in there where it's warm. Frankly, the fellow was giving me the heebie-jeebies something awful. The cop kept smiling, but his eyes were bright and sharp. Well, he's not quite feeling himself, is he? Well... I'll just go have a chat with him then, nice and easy. An ambulance will be coming soon, and they'll take him away to get some proper care. Can you wait here for a few more minutes, sir? I'll holler if I need you for anything. The look passed between the two men, and the plow driver nodded that he understood. Constable Edgemont unfastened the snap on his holster, took a deep breath, and walked up to the driver's side door of the plow. I hope you're not going to be any trouble. Please don't be any trouble. He clambered up into the cab and slid behind the wheel, leaving the door slightly ajar beside him. The man in the passenger seat stank. He smelled of urine and blood and the wild burnt wire stench of terrified sweat. The hood of his coat was pulled up over his head, masking his face. The man was hugging himself tightly and rocking back and forth. He didn't acknowledge Edgemont's presence. There was blood on his coat. A lot of it. Well, I heard that you had yourself a real hard night, mister. Edgemont tried to keep his tone light and friendly. There's an ambulance on the way, but do you mind doing me a favor and letting me have a look at your face, sir? Just so that I can assess any damage you might have suffered from exposure. Please, I want to help you. The man slowly reached up and pulled back his hood. Edgemon recoiled sharply. Oh. Holy shit. <laughs> he almost got me. <laughs> he whispered. The man's nose was smashed over to the left and was completely black. Multiple frostbite blisters on his cheeks had recently popped 
exposing large patches of raw, glistening flesh. He grinned, and the deep cracks in his lips filled with blood. I got away because, because, because I gave them Mo. They, they, they took Mo instead of me, and, and, and now he's, he's with them. In the, in, in the wind. He stopped grinning, and tears suddenly spilled down his cheeks. They, they, they got Ray too. Wasn't anything left of him. <laughs> that, 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 that wasn't my fault, though. No, no, not that one. You, you can't pin that one on me, fucking pig. <laughs> Edgemont held up a placating hand. Um, no one's blaming anyone for anything, sir. Honestly, I'm just trying to figure out what happened is all. His other hand dropped to the butt of his gun, and it stayed there. Oh, Ray. Ray fell. That's what happened. He, he, he looked back. I, 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 I told him not to, but he did. He saw, he, he saw, he saw the faces in the snow, and then, and then, and then he tripped, and he, fu he fucking fell. He fell. He fell. He fucking, he fucking tripped over his own mother, fucking feet, and then, oh, oh Jesus, oh, Jesus Christ! Oh, they were on him. Oh, they, they were fucking on him. And go. Oh. <laughs> there wasn't anything left. Was there anything left? Not really. The wind took what was left and blew it away. The man's eyes were glassy and huge. One pupil was bigger than the other. He rubbed his face with his hands and more blisters popped. Pus mixed with tears and dripped off the madman's chin. I can't... I can't stay here much longer. And Dell will be coming soon. The, 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 the ditch... The ditch won't stop him. Nothing... Will stop him. Except... Maybe fire? Fire... F fire melts the frost, right? We, we, we have to burn him. It, it's the only way. Edgemont saw that the guy was starting to hyperventilate. Shit. This is bad. I don't know who or what you're talking about, friend, but I can assure you that no one is going to burn anything. Not today. You need to calm yourself down right pronto, and I'm not kidding you. Why don't you tell me more about what happened to you out there? How's that? What's your name? That's a good place to start. Just tell me your name. He's coming for me, you stupid bastard! Don't you get it? He'll drag me back, and then to fucking eat me alive! He coiled to lunge for the cop end. Like magic, Edgemont's 40 caliber pistol was suddenly in his hand and pointed at the madman's chest. He slid out of the cab of the plow and planted his feet firmly on the hard packed snow. Freeze! Don't move! You rest easy and keep your hands where I can see them. Do you understand me? Don't move a muscle. <laughs> I've got money, the madman hissed. Lots of money. I'll give you every penny if you drive me somewhere far, 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 far away from here. Somewhere warm. I'll give you the whole fucking bundle. I promise. Just get me out of here. Sir, you aren't well. You have to understand this. There's nothing coming to get you, do you understand? Now, I'm telling you, I don't want to have to pull this trigger, but if you don't stay right where you are, then that is exactly what I am going to do. I am not going to repeat myself. Stay where you are. The man crumpled in on himself and started to sob again. No, 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 you don't understand, he said. You weren't there. You didn't see what I saw. Just take it easy and stay put, mister, and everything will be fine. Where the hell was the ambulance? It would have been nice if the boys from the fire department had shown up, too. Any sort of backup would be helpful right about now. As if on cue, the plow driver poked his head out from behind his plow and shouted, You all right over there, officer? You need some help? No, it's under control. 
Edgemon hollered back. Stay where you are, please, sir. Tell me if you see the EMT guys coming down the- Look! The madman screamed. They're out there in the field! They're coming! They're coming! The madman came surging out of the cab and went straight for Edgemont. His last word, rising in pitch like a boiling tea kettle, eyes bulging, and his blackened fingers hooked like claws. There was no time to shout a warning, no time to do anything except pull the trigger. The bullets punched through the attacking man's chest and lodged into the driver's seat of the plow behind him, sending tufted fragments of cushion stuffing floating into the air. The madman staggered a few weak steps forward and collapsed onto the road. He briefly tried to crawl, then was still. What the hell, man? You shot him. The plow driver looked on in disbelief. Shit. Well, this ain't good at all. I had to. Edgemont barked. His heart was racing. He'd never pulled the trigger while on duty before. Never. He was crazy. He was attacking me. What else could I do? The cop kneeled in the snow and grimaced at the mess the exiting bullets had made of the man's back. He rolled the dying man over her. The front of his coat sported two large, neat holes, and was wet with fresh blood. Fuck. What am I even supposed to do here, really? Fucking ambulance, where are you? Edgemont unzipped the man's coat and winced. The wounded man's chest resembled a crimson marshland. It was bubbling. That boy's done for, the plow driver observed. His voice was as dry and cold as the air around them. Heart and lungs had punctured all to hell. The ambulance ain't gonna help him out one bit. Might as well call the coroner. Edgemont closed his eyes tightly. How the hell did this happen? This was going to be a very long day indeed. You did the right thing, I guess. Look, he had a knife in his pocket. The plow operator trailed off, then said... Hey, what's in that bag? Sticking out of the guy's other inside pocket. There was a plastic bag hanging half out of the pocket in question, tattered and blood-speckled. There was a ripped manila envelope poking out of the bag. Gingerly, Constable Edgemont fished the bag out of the corpse's pocket. The envelope was full of money. The two men stared down at it in silence. How much you think is there? The plow driver whispered. His eyes were bulging. I don't know for sure. Tens of thousands, anyway. A lot. There was a rising wail of sirens in the distance, and the plow driver said, The ambulance is coming. A little too late, I guess. Maybe we should. Abruptly, Edgemont pulled a thick wad of cash from the envelope and thrust it into the other man's hands. He looked the driver square in the eye and stuffed the rest of the cash into his own pockets. Then, he crammed the blood-speckled plastic bag back where they'd found it, and it was as if the money had never existed. Do we understand each other? Whatever I say happened out here this morning, well, that's what happened. Get it? The plow driver stowed away his share of the dough and nodded. Good. He doesn't need it anymore anyway. Edgemont said, nodding at the body on the ground. I'm guessing that money probably wasn't on its way to an orphanage or anything, so don't give it a second thought, friend. Oh, I won't. The plow driver stepped back and watched, his craggy face dispassionate, as the ambulance came to a shuddering halt behind the cop's cruiser. He walked over to let the EMTs know that there was no longer any reason to hurry. Edgemont crouched down and murmured, Rest in peace, fella. I'm really sorry about what happened. You shouldn't have lunged at me like that. He patted the dead man on the shoulder and stood up, wincing at the twin pops in his knees. Edgemont didn't feel very good about the shooting, but the money made his near future seem a lot brighter. He walked over to his cruiser and pulled a stack of orange pylons and some police tape out of the trunk. The EMTs were busy going through the motions of trying to revive and stabilize the obviously dead body, as they were legally bound to do. 
The plow driver was holding an IV bag for them. Don't look so dour over there, Edgemont thought. You just had a pretty good payday. Life could be worse. Edgemont set about laying the pylons down on the road, taking his time with it. In a brief minute or two, he would have to get on the radio and inform dispatch of the incident. And then, the shit was going to hit the fan. He exhaled heavily and gritted his teeth. It had all happened so fast. In the blink of an eye, there hadn't been enough time to make another choice. In his mind's eye, he carefully replayed the final seconds of the confrontation. The madman ranting and charging at him with outstretched hands, his fingers squeezing down on the trigger. Hey, what the hell? Would you look at that? Holy shit! Edgemont called over the EMTs. Hey, forget that guy. He's dead. Come over and check this out. Over there in the field. You see that? A snow devil had formed far out in the field across the road, and it was enormous. It looked curiously solid, dense, and the cop felt a vague chill run down his spine as he watched it rip across the vast field at a high rate of speed. It was coming straight towards the spot where Edgemont was standing. The EMTs and the plow driver wandered over, the dead body on the road temporarily forgotten and they watched the towering things approach with rising unease. Hey, the plow driver blinked. There, there ain't no wind out today. How? He trailed off, and the men all shuffled closer together. None of them noticed that Jared's corpse was sitting up now. It opened its eyes. They were twin marbles of frost, dull and malevolent. It grinned and lurched to its feet. On the other side of the road, dead hands reached up from the ditch and scrabbled for purchase in the snow. A headless horror pulled itself over the edge and began to slither across the road, hands grasping and searching for warm, living flesh. Winter is hungry, and it was time to feed. You've been listening to Snow Devils by author T.W. Grimm. I'd like to personally thank you for joining me for this episode of Horror Hill. Don't forget to tune in again next week when I yet again regale you with a handful of tales to terrify, plumbed from the most depraved depths of the human imagination. Tonight's story was written by and brought to you courtesy of T.W. Grimm. Grimm is a self-published horror novelist from southwestern Ontario and the author of 99 brief scenes from the end of the world, Tripping Over Twilight, When the Stars Fall, and The Promises We Make in December, now available on Amazon.com. To learn more about T.W. and keep up with him, follow him on Twitter and Facebook. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to me. If you'd like to hear a premium, ad-free edition of tonight's and all our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive, dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program all of our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. Thanks so much for your time and for giving our sponsors a try today. When you support our sponsors, you help support this show. And that means a lot to me. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, 
You can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. Until next week, listener, when we meet up once again atop the Horror Hill, for yet another dance with darkness, I bid you good night, sleep tight, listener, and whatever you do, if you hear scratching at your door, don't open it. The darkness may have found you, but it's up to you to let it in. <laughs>